This is the second video in an ongoing series that fundamentally reflects on my background as a video game journalist. And I was a video game journalist during the crucial years when this company, Sega, really lost its way and fell apart. This video is inevitably going to have less of an upbeat and colorful and fun tone than the first video that was talking about the N64, because we're talking about failure. And we're talking about failure of a huge company that was a huge part of my childhood. And if you're watching this video, quite likely your childhood as well, Sega. Uh, now look, this video is not going to have a whole lot of props. You guys will know right away, this is not a real Sega Genesis. This is, this is from the current Sega Corporation, but this is the reissue HDMI Genesis replacement, which I'll probably do a separate video talking about this in head-to-head head -head comparison with the Super Nintendo Mini, another HDMI 16-bit reissue. I do not have with me now a Sega Saturn, um, but the point is, if you didn't see the first video, I was actually employed as a video game journalist at the time when the Sega Saturn and the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation 1 were directly competing with one another. And uh, I'm not exaggerating at all my importance or significance as a, as a journalist. I was of zero importance, absolutely zero. But what you have to understand is at that time, the industry was much more generous and open and forthcoming. So a dumb teenager like myself, who happened to get a job writing video game reviews, would get invited to the Sega corporate headquarters, would get invited and given a tour of Sega City, would get some level of inside information and promotion from Sega, would get given a Sega Saturn um, and the, the, the forthcoming games and so on and so forth. Uh, I think, so that was maybe 1995 we're talking about. And today, by contrast, you know, everything is done over the internet. Uh, if you're not writing video game reviews for the New York Times, I don't think you get this level of uh, just real-world, face-to-face interaction with these companies, and you probably don't get that level of uh, tangible uh, gifts and, and suasion provided you from the companies. Of course, one of the reasons they did that was back then there was no option for journalists to just download these games or, or something like that. So it was done much more on a face-to-face, -face, handshake basis, the way the whole industry worked. So. My analysis of why Sega declined and fell and failed falls under two categories, two headings. And the first is part of a kind of mainstream analysis that I know other YouTube channels have discussed and other websites have discussed in print and other articles have been written on it. And the second, I think, I, I have never seen anyone discuss before, and I googled around a bit before making this video and I couldn't find anyone discussing it before. So. It's an original idea to that extent. Uh, the first one I want to point out is this. What was the fundamental difference between Sega and Nintendo when they made their, their transition from the success of their 16-bit era to the failure of their 32-bit era? The transition from Sega Genesis, which was a big success, to the Sega Saturn. Sega Saturn was not just less successful, but is in many ways the start of the end of the company. Uh, say no more. It is the same difference between Sega and Sony and that exists between Sega and Microsoft. On as deep a level as is humanly possible, the corporate entity that was Sega was created for arcade games. It's even in the name of the company, service games, where they came from, what they did. And not just their business model, but their creative model and mentality about what a game was supposed to be and how it would reach the public and then be adapted to appear on a console was all utterly built around the arcade game experience. Was that true of Sony? No, not at all. Sony was a company and their corporate model and their creative process was built around making a stereo, a stereo system that sits in your, in your living room. Sony's idea of what they did was to create a TV set or a stereo or this, this kind of equipment that would sit in your living room. And then they looked at video game systems and video game software as another kind of equipment they were going to furnish you with, really, really like the furniture business, uh, living room furniture that happens to light up and make noises. Um, uh, and Microsoft, again, coming out of a different kind of corporate culture and background, making computers, making operating systems, making word processors, 
and then stepping into video game hardware and video game software from that background. Sega's mentality was totally different. So in this period, like 1995 through 1998, with the launch of the Saturn and then Nintendo 64 emerging and um, you know the, the decline and fall of the Saturn, what was most absurd was that all over the world, Sega was actively building and expanding what were normally called Sega City arcades. They were trying to build new monuments to the idea that people were going to line up and put quarters into a machine to have a five-minute entertainment experience. Now, it is not so paradoxical that today, in 2018, this same mentality Sega had, that, from my opinion, is one of the two big things that destroyed the company, um, makes their, their software and their hardware more collectible and more interesting, especially to adults today, because the arcade experience was all about uh, five minutes of entertainment. It was about very brief, very shallow, pick-up-and-play entertainment. And I've got to say this above all else. There's a difference between something being false and something being misleading. Sega was very successful in the arcades from their earliest period of activity as a, as a video game producer. The problem is they let that success mislead them, and Nintendo did not. Nintendo had a crucial, outstanding success in arcades with Donkey Kong, the original Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. Nintendo had a crucial, outstanding success in the arcades with the original Punch-Out, an arcade game that used two TV screens. It was quite innovative in the whole control system and everything. They did not let that become their obsession and, and driving and, and guiding force in Nintendo. Their corporate culture or their, their creative process, it really is what it's like here. If you think about it like cinema or writing books or like Pulp Fiction or something, um, did not become centered around the arcade. And at Sega, their mentality remained steadfastly obsessed with the arcade to such an extent that when they had a little bit of success with something like um, Wonder Boy and Monster Land, Wonder Boy and Monster Land was an action role-playing game that involved collecting coins and upgrading your armor and getting better boots so you could jump higher. What did they do? So, oh, we have to make this into an arcade game. And it's, it's the most surreal, ridiculous arcade game. The idea that people will stand there and insert quarters, stand there for like three hours or something, doing this repetitive crap. That genre, the action role-playing and the action RPG, became huge. Did Nintendo try to take Zelda and make it into an arcade game? That's as absurd as that would be. It would be as absurd as, as Nintendo saying, hey, we got a hit with Zelda. Now we got to make Zelda into an arcade game. Or even, I mean, really what's going on at Sega is not even inventing Zelda because you're so obsessed with only making things that work in the arcade formula. And Sega always had enough success for this to continue to warp their perception of the company and what it should be, and what children's entertainment should be, what home entertainment should be, what video games should be. Golden Axe, big success. Getting into the, the Saturn era, they made a game um, that spun off from the Die Hard movies, even though the Die Hard movies were already way in the past. In Japan, um, it was called... Uh, Dynamite Deca, Dynamite Detective, but in North America it's called Die Hard Trilogy. Big success in the arcade. Everything about that, even the hardware it was running on, all in the Saturn period, what's their idea of success? Oh, uh, Time Cop. What? What's the concept of time? time Cop is fun for 30 seconds, five minutes. That's the kind of experience of Time Cop. Even the name is laughable, right? What what did they do to launch time? Oh, we've got to create hardware for the arcade that's as close as possible to the Saturn so that we can have an arcade-perfect game world of the Saturn. I was a journalist at that time. I think I was given Time Cop as, as a review copy. Maybe I'm misremembering. I think they gave me Time Cop as one of their star products. That was the plan. What are they going to do with Die Hard, Die Hard Trilogy, this this game, also known as Dynamite Deck? What are they going to do? Again, they, they, they developed this arcade hardware that was called... Um, sorry, it's named after one of the moons of Saturn. So there's the Saturn, and then the other hardware is Titan. That's it. Titan is one of the moons of Saturn. They developed hardware in tandem with the home hardware so that they could then advertise to you, we have an RP arcade perfect conversion. You know, this sorry, this shows how hilarious, mis, hilariously misconceived it is to try to launch and promote home software 
through arcade software. And it means that you're inevitably producing incredibly shallow, stupid video games that are fun and eye-catching for 30 seconds or, or five minutes. And this is not what was happening at Nintendo. This is not what was happening at uh, uh, Sony or Microsoft. Um, the one real parallel that nobody at Sega would want to think about was the rise and success and then eventual failure of the Neo Geo. So Neo Geo AES, Neo Geo uh, Arcade and, and, and Home System. Neo Geo was built on that concept that what people really wanted was an arcade perfect experience at home. And again, today, if you're an adult, maybe you find that stuff very collectible. If you spent over $300 so you can sit down and play a game like Neo Geo Bowling, that's fun and well animated and eye catching for 30 seconds or five minutes. This is a business model that's never going to work. And whatever, again, success can be misleading. It would be false to say that the Neo Geo was a total flop, even though it was incredibly expensive. And for the amount of money you spent, it offered you a really low quality, really shallow arcade like experience. That was what they tried to do. Sega had enough success during the 16 bit era that it sustained their faith in this arcade centered business model, which had been everything they'd been doing since they, they started as, as a company. Um, and then again, right through the Saturn period, there, there are some infamous quotations from the, the guy who was then the CEO of Sega of America, where he actually said, no more 2D games, no more role-playing games. He talked about all those genres he didn't want in the system at all. It was this total overweening focus on, on games like the ones I've mentioned um, that were hits in the arcade, however fleetingly, and thinking that was going to drive um, adoption of, of this home system. So what I've just said, this is kind of my first point, I'm definitely not the only person who, who picked up on this. I might be one of the few people who was employed as a um, employed as a journalist at that time and who saw inside. Uh, again, not like I had any. It, it's not deep. I mean, it was very open. None of this was hidden. This was overtly the business model they were preparing to you. So again, it's not like I'm telling you some secret. It's like if you were alive at the time when Coca-Cola had a certain marketing strategy. This is what the whole company was doing. And they were about to be wiped out. They were about to be destroyed by Sony, who had none of these misconceptions and none of these hang-ups and didn't have this approach to, to hardware or software. And they also were, of course, being beaten by Nintendo, who probably understood several different things better than Sega did, including the fact that what they were doing fundamentally was more like a children's storybook. Ulti what is the legend of Zelda, ultimately, right? Uh, so the only thing I'd say here briefly is, of course, there are... Counterexamples, but the counterexamples within Sega, I think, really prove the point. Okay, so somebody might comment below this video. Oh, well, you know, you say that, but Sega had the Fantasy Star series. So if you guys don't know, Fantasy Star, someone might say, is similar to Legend of Zelda, very broadly, very loosely. Okay, what did Sega do with with Fantasy Star? The original Fantasy Star, Fantasy Star One, was this huge hit this huge innovation, everyone got excited about it. They did not feature it or put resources into it or make a cartoon for it the way Nintendo did with Zelda, right? Because that was not their focus or interest as, as a company. Their interest was totally on the arcade and arcade-like game experiences. So again, even the exceptions prove the rule. Some other company who had a hit with Fantasy Star would have said, wow, Here's something we need to be doing. Here's something we need to focus on. Making a game that has a story in text form and takes hours to play. It's, it's for children, you know, and it combines these elements. There's a little bit of strategy and exploration or whatever. Um, again, very, very broadly similar to Zelda. They're not that similar. It doesn't matter. Um, and develop the company in that direction. And that's not what they did. So, again, where's the Fantasy Star cartoon? Where are the signs that at a, at a corporate level or even just at a, at a creative level? That was what they saw as the future of the company. They're not there. So yes, you can you can pick and choose examples that are a counter argument, but I think in broad brush strokes, that was what differentiated Sega from all of its competition. Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony, and that was their short term success and their long term failure, their doom. Okay. The second point I wanted to make is this. Sega 
and, and again, part of this I've never heard anyone say before on the internet. From the creation of the SG-1000, the SG-1000 was the precursor to the Sega Master System. Sega thought that the key to their success was being first, coming out before Nintendo, and having new hardware maybe every two years, like as often as possible, bringing out new hardware. And anyone today, anyone just from a consumer perspective, would say that's insane. How can you expect parents to buy a new video game system every two years? That's completely ridiculous. This, so that part, other people have dealt with said. Here's the thing nobody's said before. The most ridiculous thing of all is, how can you expect third-party software developers to learn how to program from scratch, to go back to assembly code and make new tools and new libraries, and go back, basically like going back to college and learn how to program a video game again every two years. And hear me out on this, it's a little bit more sophisticated than you might think. That's the most crucial problem, and they didn't experience it with their first several transitions. SG-1000 comes out, successful, but of course not successful enough. Within just a couple of years, the Mark II and the Mark III come out. Mark III is a significant technological improvement on the SG-1000, but fundamentally the same processor, fundamentally the same architecture, uh, programmers could take code they did for the SG-1000 and rehash it, rework it to run on the Mark III, no problem. Mark III is succeeded by Sega Master System. So even though there's a discontinuity, even though from the consumer perspective, it's like, whoa, this company is asking me to buy new hardware every, every year, every two years, all the time they're bringing out new hardware at least from the software designer's perspective, from the programmer's perspective, they're able to build up the same skills continually and apply it to the evolving hardware. Because the hardware, it is getting better. It can have more colors on screen and more sprites and more animation, but it's still similar from an insider's perspective. Um, this actually continued to a greater extent than most people appreciate in the transition from 8-bit to 16-bit. The Sega Genesis was in many, many ways just an upgraded Sega Master System, and they tried to conceal this. It doesn't actually require any kind of adapter to run 8-bit Master System titles. It's completely continuous on such a hardware level in terms of the, the architecture. Um, they, they, the cartridges don't fit, but for example, Fantasy Star, um, they put out a collectible edition, which was the Master System Fantasy Star cartridge, inside the plastic housing of a Genesis cartridge, and it would run on the Sega Genesis with no emulator, no adapter. This is totally different from a situation like the so-called Super Game Boy. A Super Game Boy has its own computer. It has a lot of hardware. Basically, a Super Game Boy has all of the hardware you'd have inside a Game Boy, then feeding the data to a Super Nintendo. That's much more than just an adapter or software emulation. That's hardware. Um, there's nothing like that. So again, people who had put years of work into learning how to make a very crude baseball game on the SG-1000 and on the Sega Master System could now take that and directly recycle their efforts programming a baseball game in 16-bit for the Sega Genesis, right? So it was new hardware coming out, consumers had to pay more, but most of the creative staff were able to recycle a lot of their assets, take their job training and experience, and apply it again. Guess when this broke down? This continuity of hardware and, and programming skills completely and utterly broke down with the transition to the Sega Saturn. And that's the universal complaint at third-party third software houses and so on, was Sega Saturn was incredibly tough to code for, if you didn't know assembly code, if you weren't able to work from scratch and put a ton of time and resources into retraining all of your staff, Sega didn't provide you with the libraries you needed, software libraries. Um, it, it was just a huge investment of time and money to learn how to code for this thing. Uh, you, you, so there was a total discontinuity from the, the creative uh, people's point of view. And the companies that were able to do it were companies like Capcom. Capcom just had the depth of resources and skills, and they devoted enough people to developing everything they needed to be able to produce great software for the Sega Saturn. 
But you see, Sega didn't change their attitude. They were into this really tight cycle of obsolescence. So you guys already know the story. Five minutes after the Genesis comes out, they're working on the Sega CD, also known as the Mega CD. Could have been great. You'd need to support it for years to get software really taking advantage of what Sega CD had to offer. Never happened. Five minutes after that, bringing out the Sega 32X, a 32-bit system building on a lot of the same bases. Uh, could have could have been okay. I'm not going to say it's could have been great. Never really developed. It was undercut. Um, software designers, software houses that put resources into it felt cheated, um, had the ground cut out from under them. Five minutes after that, Sega Saturn comes out. So the rate of systems going obsolete, they kept up at this breakneck pace, which they thought was part of their success in the earlier transition from SG-1000 to Master System, Master System to the 16-bit era, Sega Genesis and Mega Drive. But again, the same principle. It's, it's not something that's false. It's something that's true but misleading. They felt this was part of their success. Ultimately, it, it destroyed them as a company. And then obviously when they made the next transition from Saturn to uh, uh, to the Dreamcast, uh, nobody was with them anymore. They'd alienated exactly all the people they'd need to support them. And they knew that. This is a well-known fact. Sega originally was going to release the Dreamcast under a new company where the name would just be Dreamcast. They were actually going to remove the name Sega. There were many companies that ended up publicly denouncing them and breaking from them when the Sega Saturn, at some point during the Sega Saturn's life, not necessarily at the beginning when it launched, at some point they got fed up and walked. Um, one of those I remember happened while I was a, a video game journalist. And the other thing you guys might be forgetting is Sega relied really heavily on a software house called Electronic Arts. And Electronic Arts already made it clear they were sick and tired of Sega's crap when they jumped ship to support the 3DO, the Panasonic 3DO, Panasonic 3DO failed. Yeah, my girlfriend's never heard of the Panasonic 3DO. Yeah, I do not have a Panasonic 3DO to hold up as a prop. That's for damn sure. I know electronic arts from PC. Yeah. Right. Well, they've been. They're still around. They're still massively successful. And no, but they made. You have a bunch of games here for Sega that are electronic arts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were very, very successful software arts for the 16-bit era and and continuing after. That already made it very clear that even electronic arts, who'd been you know a crucial part of Sega's success. They had run out of patience with this company. They were looking to jump ship to anyone else who was uh, who was offering a, a better alternative, and jump ship they did. Okay, so there you go, guys. Uh, again, maybe a bit of a downer, but I mean that is why, from my perspective, you know, Sega failed. I have many videos on this channel, by the way. I have a playlist <laughs> um, where I really do regret the role that video games had in my own life. Um, and I can remember the different points in my youth when I kind of broke away from video games and wanted to have a more meaningful life. And in a lot of ways, the period of my life when I was involved in video games journalist, I was already too old to, to unironically love or enjoy video games. Video games were already something I really kind of looked down my nose at as a, as a snob. I mean, it was interesting. And it was interesting being swept up in this particular moment in the history of the video game industry where there was intense competition and nobody knew what was going to happen next. I mean, nobody knew what the future of Sega and Nintendo were. And what happened next was Sony. Sony <laughs> clean, Sony wiped them all off the map. Nobody really saw that coming, I think. Nobody thought that, you know, a company that makes this kind of hardware. But this is what I say. My other videos, and I, I'd like to talk about this more in, in future videos too, because it's interesting. I mean, I reflect on, really briefly, I remember at one point in high school, I'd totally stopped playing video games. And then I made this new friend, and he became a really close friend of mine for several years. And he was really dragging me back into playing video games because he was still into it, and I was completely done with it. And I think we all go through those kinds of things where you have some connection in your life or some friend who, you know, is still excited about this stuff, and you feel it's childish and you've given up on it. And then again, it's bizarre, but I ended up being pulled back into video games by being paid, and it was really very generous. I was paid very when you're being paid to play video games, suddenly you get interested. Um, but I mean, the sense in which video games are a waste of time, I think it is worth reflecting also, you know, do they have to be, you know, I, I've said this since forever on the internet, you know, there's no reason why, put it this way, there's no reason why an article on a website has to be worse than an article in a magazine, 
in a newspaper, in a journal, or even a peer review journal. I'm cynical as hell about peer review, topic for another video. By the same token, there's no real reason why literature, especially if we're talking about children's literature, which doesn't have that many words, there's no reason why a children's storybook has, should be worse on a cartridge as opposed to being worse on a DVD like a movie, as opposed to being worse in, in book format. One medium or another doesn't really define this. However, if you were to ask over a 50-year period, why are comic books so much worse than other forms of literature? Why is it that comic books are worse than, um, uh, you know, even mainstream pop uh, literature like... Um, uh, uh, yeah, okay, my girlfriend says Harry Potter. I was going to say detective stories or something. You know, uh, things that are in book format but are very much just trying to be mass literature. Sherlock Holmes, there's a good example. Sherlock Holmes originally published in newspapers and then published in books. Why is Sherlock Holmes a step up from Batman, Spider-Man, and the X-Men? Well, one of the most fundamental reasons is scheduling and the organization of labor, right? One of the most fundamental reasons is that video games, like comic books were produced by heartless corporations who wanted all the work done in two months. You know, <laughs> okay, you got the script written. Oh, okay, you have till Tuesday to write the script. Okay, they're doing character design. Character design is going to be done in two weeks, and then we got a code, and then we got a music composer is doing this. All this stuff was done on such a tight schedule with no sincere interest in the final product. And the focus, as I say, something as subtle as the focus on arcade games as opposed to other kinds of immersive experiences, as opposed to educational content, as opposed to just sincerely trying to provide children's entertainment, as opposed to thinking of yourself as a furniture manufacturer that just happens to also make video games. Whatever those corporate perspectives may be, the corporation that owns you know, the hardware and software and that sets the schedule and shapes the creative process, that utterly determines the quality and content of the, the quality of the ensuing content um, and in a profound way. So even though X-Men, oh, we're talking about over like a 30-year period or 50-year period, X-Men is very different from Batman. Different company and just different writers, different artists. But nevertheless, they were both produced by this kind of grinding, soulless, anti-creative, for-profit corporate structure. And both the success and failure of Sega reflects that kind of meta-analysis, if you like, the higher levels of, of the organization of labor and the creative process. And sadly, the meaninglessness of so many hours of my own childhood reflects this also. Because the stuff I was reading, like Batman, was produced in five minutes on schedule to produce a monthly comic for profit, with as many spin-offs for merchandising as possible and tie-ins to TV shows and movies. This stuff was not produced, even like Sherlock Holmes was produced at that level of artistry or creativity. This stuff was not produced, you know, in the same way that even George R. R. Martin writes Game of Thrones or something. It, this was not produced in an educational way or artistic way. It was produced in this kind of horrible for brother way. So, I mean, many, many hours lost reading schlock comic books. And, you know, video games, uh, regardless of the format of the particular corporation, yeah, ultimately, sadly, this was a, a medium where for my generation, um, whatever potential they had to be a positive part of my childhood, I think was undercut by the corporate conditions that produced them. With few exceptions! <laughs> I think I should do a, a follow-up video on my most... My most positive experiences with video games growing up. Was there anything good or was it all just a complete waste of my time that I now look back on as a, as a crippling source of regret in, uh, in how I grew up in, in modern Western Canada? Because I think, I think there probably are. Stay tuned.